Today I'm in conversation with Professor Jamie Hacker-Hughes, who is a consultant clinical psychologist and past president of the British Psychological Society. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Natalie. <laughs> Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about why speaking in this series is important to you. Sure, yeah. Speaking in this series is really important to me. Those things are both true. Um, I am a consultant clinical psychologist. I was president of the British Psychological Society. But I've also had mental health problems for two thirds of my life and severe, more severe mental health problems for the last third of my life. And I think it's just really important to share those experiences, um, really to show that to have, um, I don't actually call them mental health problems. I, I know people understand them as that. I call them sort of psychological health problems. To have psychological health problems is, it's okay. It's not incompatible with, with you know, work, successful work, um, a career, um, happiness, you know, there are these ways through these things. So yeah, any opportunity I get, I get onto my soapbox. So th thank you very much, Natalie. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. And, 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 and really important and great to kind of have you as a part of the series. We'll be We'll have, be, be speaking to many different voices at many different stages in their career mm. uh, and, and also mental health nursing and uh, also as well as psychology professionals. So, mm. um, yeah, it's, it's about raising a choir of voices as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Um, and the more we speak out. Absolutely. The more the merrier. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking a bit before about, um, about the particular... The particular phenomenon of being a mental health professional and being somebody who has struggled with psychological difficulties mm. um, as a thing in and of itself and yeah. I wondered if you could say a bit about that. Yeah I, I, I'd love to. So, so I, I mentioned the two-thirds of my life bit because when I was in my 20s um, I suffered suddenly really pretty much out of the blue from severe panic disorder and it came it came out of the blue i was doing a stressful job i was living you know a, a fast uh, london life you know dashing around and staying up late and probably drinking more alcohol than i should have been doing and drinking more coffee definitely than i should have been doing and smoking more cigarettes than i should have been doing so you know it's actually not surprising that you would end up having the symptoms and like precipitate the panic anyway so i did and i had and i had really bad panics really bad i mean i know, you know everyone um uh, has um sort of psychological health problems of you know, varying extents and yeah there are panics and panics but these were panics when i had to stop my car in the middle of the dartford bridge you know these were panics when i had to get out of tube trains um these were panics when i had to just leave my car in busy traffic you know really these were panics where I got rushed to A and E so regularly, um, and, and they were horrible. And I went to see GPs who prescribed various medication, which was actually not a lot of good at all. Then I went to see a lovely guy. He was a psychiatrist. He was called Christopher Bass um, at the Maudsley, and he gave me a one-session cognitive behavioural explanation of panic. And I thought, wow! I thought, wow! So yeah, that, that for me explains everything, uh, explains a lot anyway. Um, and that actually precipitated my interest in psychology. So, so when I was having all these panics, I wasn't a psychologist, I was in IT, sales and marketing. But that's what triggered my interest in actually you know, chucking it all in and, and going back to university and studying for psychology. And I did. I took a 10% pay cut, a 90% pay cut to go on to 10% of my pay to go to the Maudsley as a sort of nursing assistant. So, so, so that's one sort of angle in, you know, how um, having an experience of psychological difficulties leads many people into careers in psychological health. It does. It absolutely does. That a lot of these people will, in one way or another, have had experiences of psychological health problems that led them into careers in psychology. And I know that for a fact, because I could look around my cohort when I was doing my clinical psychology training, and there were people who probably had had issues with 
um, eating, there were probably people who'd had issues with addiction, there was me with my panic, you know, there were lots of, so that's one, one thing. And then the other thing is uh, that, um, you know, when you then go on and study and you do your studying in psychology, or in my case, in clinical psychology, which gives you a huge insight into, um, into psychological health problems and their cause and their treatment and everything else. I don't know about other people. I really don't know about other people. But um, I think I probably gained a bit of a sense of immunity, you know. I'd done the course, I'd done the training, I'd you know, been in my experiential groups, I'd had my therapy. So that was it, wasn't it? Well, the answer was it wasn't it. Um, because five years after I qualified, yeah, almost exactly to the day, five years after I qualified, um, suddenly it was the normal, it was a typical thing. There was a year which had had lots of stuff, you know, job changes and salary changes and career changes and babies and house moves and, you know, stress upon stress upon stress upon stress. And I came down with massive depression, really, really, really massive depression. Um, and, and that was a real shock. It was a real shock. Here I was, you know, clinical psychologist, heading for you know, becoming a consultant psychologist five years after qualification. And I had really, really bad, couldn't face people, couldn't answer the phone, couldn't open letters, um, suicidal ideation, suicidal suicidal action, you know, that sort of really bad, really bad depression. Mm. And that was a shock. That was a shock. I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> you know, I'd been spending my, my, my days for the previous, you know, several years treating people with you know, depression and anxiety problems. Um, and yet I couldn't, I couldn't see it coming. I really couldn't see it coming until, until it was not too late, but until I'd sort of passed the point of, of no return and and you know I wasn't going to be able to nip it in the bud it was going to mm. you know it was going to, to, to bring me down and as I said I, I, mean, I just couldn't I couldn't face people I remember saying to my other half I couldn't even think of doing a simple shop, shop at Sainsbury's I don't know what I said to that but it stuck with me and I couldn't the thought of going to a supermarket and, and I mean what would I do where would I go um you know, I, 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 I just couldn't. Um, so it was a real, real shock. Of course, not of course, but as it happened, in my case, people rallied around, my partner was excellent, her family were excellent, her father-in-law turned up with a full massage table um, and sort of put me on it and gave me a full body massage with some angelic movement, the music in the background. You know, amazing, amazing, really. And the really lovely thing was that I, I was just, I was this psychologist in the community community mental health team. At the time. That's what that's my job. They were absolutely fantastic. My colleagues were absolutely brilliant, and they just sent loving messages and encouraging messages. And they said, "Just take your time. It's fine. Come back when you're ready." And you know, when I got back, my desk was covered with cards and flowers and and it was lovely and I know that that's not the sort of reception that a lot of people get absolutely not you get it if you go into hospital with some sort of medical condition you don't normally get it if you if you have some psychological problems you really don't and that's a, you know, a big problem in itself um but I was really lucky I did um and so well, that's how so, it should be yeah yeah, it is how it should be. And I was on a very gradual phase, return to work, and it was all manageable until next year I relapsed and it all happened again. <laughs> At the same time. But no, it didn't all happen again because I saw it, yeah, I saw it coming a bit. Um, um, but, you know, and, and people knew then, you know, this is Jamie, you know, he gets depression in January. Um, and uh, you know, they knew what to do, so they got out the what to do with Jamie when he gets depression in January file and did it again. <laughs> and it was much quicker, and I, I was, I was yeah. back at work much quicker. But yeah, the main point was there is 
there is rightly or wrongly, or I had rightly or wrongly, you know, despite all the stuff, stuff we say as psychologists about um, speaking as a psychologist, about how we empathize with people and you know, we try and understand people and we really empathize with their experience. Many of us actually aren't prepared for having that experience ourselves once we've trained, uh, you know, once we're the other side. We're not immune, of course, we're not immune. Um, we've got a lot more insight, perhaps, we've got a lot possibly more insight into what we need. Um, and to you know how we'd like to be treated and cared for and related to, uh, but we're certainly not immune. Yeah, so that was that was when we had our chat earlier on. That was something I thought that it would be worth talking about. The shock of mm. suffering major psychological problems um, when you're a qualified psychological health professional. But it is, it is also somebody else that I've spoken to has also said things like um, there's, there's your own personal pain that you're dealing with uh, when you're breaking down and, and, and everything about that that you have to manage. But there's also this other layer on top of that, which is the fact that you've almost transgressed by being a mental health professional who's broken down, that in some way that's not supposed to happen. Um, and, and perhaps there's quite a big buy-in to this sense of immunity. Um, and it, and it's, very, it's very hard when you shatter that, that, that kind of illusion that we're not all human. It is, it is. And yeah, in, in a way, so it takes me on to one of the other things I wanted to talk about because the, the, the next bit of the story, I mean, you might have guessed where this was heading to anyway, was that um, when I became depressed, I was prescribed antidepressants, which I took and they they were awful, they made things worse, and then I was given other ones, and they were terrible, and eventually I got the right ones for me, and that's fine. And you know, that's fine, and then I stopped taking them, then I became depressed again, and I was put back on these original things, which worked very well, tricyclic, so very old-fashioned antidepressants, but they worked for me. Over the course of the year, even though I was seeing the psychiatrist who prescribed these things regularly, I just felt my mood going higher, and higher and higher and higher and I kept saying to him Roy because that was his name um, Roy I I think my, I'm not comfortable with what's happening with my, with my mood I think you know I need mm. to start coming off these yeah no no it'll be fine it'll be fine, it'll be fine. and my mood was getting higher and higher and higher and then one day I was having peer supervision with a colleague and we were talking about cases and that was fine and then I said to her um, I've got to go now because my son and I have got to get into a space rocket and fight the third world war and I suddenly thought hang on <laughs> hang on that doesn't quite sound right and she thought but hang on it definitely doesn't sound right um, and, and basically I went into a full fully blown, I mean, really, that was just the beginning of a hypomanic state. Um, almost certainly the medication induced, but yeah, but, but, but I did. And so then there were you know, several days of you know, delusions and hallucinations and all sorts of funny ideas and extremely strange behavior. Uh, and I was just definitely, definitely not right. Um, it sounds really painful. And, it, it, well, it was, yeah, it was, um, in a different way. It was painful in a different way. I mean, when I was depressed, it was absolutely painful because you know, I was actively suicidal, and that's, you know, that's not great. So in the middle of the night, sort of thinking about you know, what I was going to do and actually driving a car and being in a position where lots of times you know, when I could have you know, driven into things and people and stuff. Um, so that was, yeah, painful. Um, in a way, when I um, was psychotic, when I had this, this sort of hypermanic state, um, I was detached from reality. So I don't know, I didn't know, it was certainly painful for others around me. I'm not quite sure how, but it was probably painful when I sort of came down from it to think about some of the things I you know, said. Hey. And done, yeah. Um, anyway, the, 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 um, 
the end of it was that this same psychiatrist, he accepted that I was probably right and I should have come off this, these antidepressants. And uh, he said, I think, you know, I think we're looking at bipolar disorder. And I ticked all the boxes you know, in, in the recipe book for having bipolar disorder and the two episodes of depression in my hypomanic episode. Um, and so 20 years ago this year, um, I started on lithium. Um, which for me has been the wonder drug. But initially, and we were talking, we could just bring it back, back full circle. Um, this guy um, used to come and see me at home. He was very kind to do that. I think he, I mean, he did it because I was working for the Ministry of Defence and whatever, whatever the reason was, he came to see me at home. But when I, when I had to see him about the bipolar, I had to go to his clinic. And by that time, yeah. I'd, I'd, I started doing a lot, a lot of work in, in, in private practice alongside my, my NHS practice. Um, and so when I went to the hospital, I knew everybody there, but I knew them all professionally. You know, they referred to me, they referred their patients to me for treatment. And I was absolutely mortified. I mean, talk about self-stigma. I was really, really mortified. And, and, and exactly what you said earlier on, Natalie, I actually hid in a cupboard. I hid in a cupboard because there was someone coming down the corridor who was a professional colleague, psychiatrist, who, who, you know, who I'd worked with, who referred to me. And I didn't want him to see him you know, in, the, in the waiting room to see the- It's cupboard. heartbreaking, actually. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> No, people should feel that way because you're not the I, only one who's expressed that. No, I, well, I, I, I did. Absolutely massive. Um, just in that moment, stigma. And, you know, definitely self-stigma rather than other stigma. You know, he probably would have been really nice about it. Or he would have been discreet or professional. I don't know what he would have been. But I know that in that moment, the only place to be was in the covers. <laughs> so, um, which... Mm. It says it all, doesn't it? Really, it's really it does. Right. It's it's really it's really powerful kind of enacting of how we seem to need to feel that we have to hide these things away, you know, yeah. um, and, and and not not just us personally, but also wonder and and you know a lot of my activism is is systemic activism. It's what what systems do with uh, vulnerability. You know, they don't mm. like it very much. It's very difficult to be alongside, whether it's with those who use services who are mental health professionals, who aren't mental health professionals. And it can get, you know, brushed away, put into shadowy corners, mm. into cupboards, you know. It can make people mm. inhabiting that role feel like they need to literally do things like that. Mm. And it's, it's actually just very sad. And it can be very divisive, you know. It can. Right? It can. It, it can be really, and I don't know, I'm not quite sure when I became a, a real sort of anti-stigma campaigner, anti-stigma activist. It was probably not long after that, actually, that I just, I just I realised the power of stigma. But as I said, it was still stigma, it was, it was shame, and it was shame. Yeah. Um, I was heaping all this stuff um, on myself. Um, Having said that, I was then I was working for the Ministry of Defence, which at that time was a very, very, very non-accepting of um, all sorts of differences, actually, but certainly some psychological health and some difficulties. And to actually sort of come out and proud and to say, um, 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 yeah, I, I have, you know, I have mood difficulties. I have bipolar disorder. I am bipolar. Whatever. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't go down well, um, so I had to be so quite careful in that in that environment about that. It worked very well because it meant that um, I was actually able to go and do things that I probably wouldn't have been able to do uh, if I'd been more open. Um, and so I was able to go out to you know Afghanistan and Iraq and all over the place, but I went always with. Uh, alongside a psychiatrist who happened to know the full story, um, and it so you know, so 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 that 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 was that was fine. So I was, I was lucky. Mm -hmm. um, what, but yeah, so so uh, I think it it was it was that 
it was that moment when I sort of really, really um, got on board with the sort of anti-stigma um, conversation. Uh, I ended up writing a book about it somewhere um, called The Battle Against Stigma, which was... Well, have the natural- Yeah, yeah. yeah and, uh, and this was aimed at people in the, in the military to say, actually, look at all these people. You've got the most decorated person in the British Army has psychological health problems. The, the person with the highest medal for gallantry has psychological health problems. You know, the, you know, this, this high the senior commander has psychological health problems. So, go, so get over it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's really interesting because in a way, when you think about um, the way that um, having mental health difficulties as a mental health professional gets really over conflated with ideas of competency or incompetency, you know, having a mental yeah. health problem or, yeah. or a physical health problem or whatever, uh, however you want to choose your language is actually a neutral thing. It, it just happens. It happens to lots of people all the time. Certainly many of us throughout our lifetimes, myself included, as you know, and um, it's just, it's just a neutral thing. It's a thing that happens, but somehow, you know, when you're um, in a position of being a mental health professional, um, you're not allowed to have it. <laughs> or if, if you have it, it's a terrible, terrible thing, and it means you should be immediately be struck off. You know, those, those are the fears that stop people from being able to speak. Well, they are, although I'm not quite sure what stage I began doing it, but there's this whole issue about disclosure to, you know, to clients, to patients, you know, call, call them what you will. Um, and actually, I think I've always done it. You know, even when I came into psychology with my you know, history of anxiety disorders, if it was appropriate, I'd say, well, actually, I've had something very similar to you. Not the same, absolutely not the same. I've had something very similar. And so I know a little bit about you know, what you might be going through. And almost, yeah. I was going to say almost all the time, probably all the time that's been well received. People haven't actually said, ah, really, I'm, I want to see someone else straight away. I'm not going to see you anymore. Now, as I know that you're tainted, you know, I want someone who's whole and perfect to sort me out, please. Not, not some no, sort no. Of break, <laughs> People have a hard time, time trying to find that, I think. It doesn't, broken, doesn't broken, practical person like you. So, yeah. Um, and, um, and, I, and yeah, I've done it ever since. I've done it ever since. And luckily, <laughs> because, because of just my range of experiences, you know, I've had experiences of anxiety, I've had experiences of depression, I've had experiences of, of uh, you know, as a, 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 a mood disorder, so-called. I've had periods of, you know, um, you know, psychotic sort of experiences. So I can relate to lots of people <laughs> on lots of levels about all sorts of different things. Yeah, I've been there, done that. No, don't do that. But I do, I just, if it's appropriate, I can say, actually, you know, I have had experience of something a bit, a bit similar. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, for me, it's been really helpful as a clinician to be able to do that. Because straight it's, away... It's- but it just brings you down. It just well, not brings you down. It just you know, it, it puts you where you should be, alongside. And when so, you're when you're talking about that, some, some it, there is something about power dynamics um, that's really important mm. to look at. And there's also something else about um, how the NHS uh, can sometimes uh, perceive lived experience. So in in, in the sense, that we know that it's okay for peer support workers to have lived experience, for example. It's okay for lived experience to be located there. Um, and I know, I know now that more often it's um, as a desirable on job descriptions for many of us. Uh, so that has changed. But it used to be the case that you, know, you, 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 you could have it over there, but you, you definitely can't have it over there. So I, I'm not sure what kind of uh, population sample um, you know, the training courses in the NHS think they're drawing from when they're, when they're you know, bringing in people to work in this area. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it is just from a human population sample of which we will all, you know, have our experiences. Um, but yeah, to, yeah. To, to kind of join up those ends, really, of understanding the lived experience is, 
is through through the ranks if you like you know that from that, that term you know from the top to the bottom left right and center in every single job role it absolutely is it absolutely is um and i think and i've i've been qualified 20 yeah 25 more than that 27 now 27 years now i think it's just been really really important and a really really important part of my continued professional development has been having the experiences i've had without a doubt i couldn't agree with you more uh, and, and um, from my own personal experience from other people that I've uh, spoken to, it's not just about wrapping lived experience in support talk, although support is incredibly important, of course, but it's also about completing the circle by valuing what that lived experience brings into enhancing your personal development, your professional development, your clinical practice. And as we know, it is a personal professional development trajectory all the way through the career span. And the extent to which we can value lived experience at all, even, even in our kind of registered mental health professionals, I think there's something about the extent to which we can value lived experience in general, because otherwise it's a big tell, you know. Mm. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It, as I said, lived experience, yeah, if you just think about it, as I mentioned just earlier, as you know, continuing professional development, lived experience is such a, such a, it's a huge component of that, a huge contributor to that. You know, you can go on all the CPD courses that, that you like, but actually if you have, if you have lived experience of you know, a psychological condition or another, um, oh, it can make a huge but in, in, many, in so many ways in relating to other people in understanding your subject in understanding your discipline in self care and that's really really important you know there is no way there isn't there is no way now that I would um, that I would behave well probably it goes for lots of us doesn't it um, in the same way as I did when I was in my 20s I mean there isn't because I know that, that that yeah, you know, living that sort of life, sort of, sort of long term, sort of full on, um, is incredibly damaging, so sort of, potentially, so sort of psychologically as well as physically, and so actually, you know, living, uh, trying to live a healthy life, you know, n not just about sort of nutrition and sleep and, and drink and alcohol and all that stuff. Um, but about boundaries and work-life balance, you know, and self-care, that I think can be, and in my case has been, really informed by the sort of experiences I was talking about. Because, you know, I, I just look after myself or try and look after myself better and keep myself as, as, as well as I can. There's no guarantee that, you know, nothing else is going to come around the corner but you know there's only so much we can do about that yeah hmm. it's it's really it's really great to listen to your story jamie and, and and i just think there's there's something so lovely about being able to have very open conversations about um you know from the heart really about hmm. who we are as people hmm. doing these jobs and hmm. that uh yeah i i I just hope that those people who are listening will continue to find these, you know, these conversations, uh, leave them feeling less isolated if they're going through a tough time themselves right now. Um, that they have a narrative to step into, to listen to from other people who are able to model this, that, that this humanity is okay. You know? Yeah, well, I really, really hope so. Um, when you're in the middle of, something when you're in the middle of a psychological crisis it's very very difficult to see your way out of it I and mean, i always talk to the people that i work with about you know it being often as though you're down at the bottom of a deep deep valley with mountains on either side and you just cannot see the way out but eventually by struggling slowly 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 oh you see actually um, there is something else, you know, there is something else over the other side, and it's got a top. And there is something else, 
And actually, um, you know, now that I've got up to this height, I can see all this other stuff that I didn't couldn't see before when I was down at the bottom. Um, and so, yeah, it, it can, if you're in the middle of something, it can be really, really difficult. But there is a way through, there, there is a way out. And there is, is a way on. I mean, I've been incredibly, incredibly, incredibly fortunate, Natalie, in my, my career. So I said, qualified 27 years ago um, and started off working in the health service and then moved across to work for the Ministry of Defence after five years. Amazing, amazing time in the Ministry of Defence, dealing with psychological health professionals from all over the world, which is just amazing. Um, became um, head of psychology for the Ministry of Defence and defence consultant advisor in, in psych clinical psychology, which is just incredible. I was the first, first ever defence consultant advisor in clinical psychology, so I was the only one. So I'd sit around with this huge table in Whitehall with all these sort of military and medical sort of admirals and colonels and what have you who were all you know, defence consultants and advisors and their bit of medicine. And then there was little me. And um, yeah, so that was, that, was, that, that was great. That was really great. Um, and then what a, yeah, and then I was really lucky to be an academic for a number of years and to set up a research institute and to become a professor and write stuff and teach stuff, which was great. And then one day the psychologist fell open on my table and it said, nominations open, BPS president. And I thought, I could do that. <laughs> I could do that. I could do that. Why not? You know. So I did. So I stood to be the BPS president and I was elected to be the BPS president. And the way it works is you do a three year term. So you're president elect and then you're president and then you're vice president. And I actually just treated the whole thing as though, sort of in terms of input, as though I was president all the way through and the amount of, just in terms of the amount of effort and energy I put into it. Um, and it was absolutely wonderful to be able to go all around the country to talk to the 10 different specialties within psychology at all of their conferences, which you get to go to and have conversations like this and be open and forthright and say, you, know, you might not know, know this, but something I would like to tell you is I've had bipolar disorder for 15 years um, and, um, and it's okay. <laughs> But it's all right, and you know, and here and, and here I am, um, and yeah, I was just really, really good to just to be in that position to do all the other stuff as well, to do all the sort of, you know, de developmental stuff and the leadership stuff, but to be able to champion this message that it's okay, it's okay, you know, you can. Um, have psychological health problems and you can do your job and you can go to work and you can have relationships and you, know, you can be a person um, and you're not a second class citizen, you know, you're not broken, you're not sullied, you're not tarnished, you're not defiled. In fact, you're probably a lot stronger through it, through that experience. And just to be able to have those sorts of conversations and of course, you know, because I sort of stood up, stood up on a podium and sort of dropped it into whatever I was talking about, you know, then I'd have lots of, you know, uh, sort of um, conversations afterwards, and lots of people afterwards would come up and have a chat about yes. stuff and say, so glad you said that because, you know, I've had whatever it is and I'm doing my ex yeah. training so, so good, so good really, to be able to do I that. love those conversations. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's, it's, they come up to you after conferences and, and, and kind of talk to you about um, how something's been opened up um, or, that, you know, they email you afterwards and you're able to put them in touch with other good people. Yeah, and that was exactly. always the idea of the, um, 
the peer network, you know, integrate is that it's about linking people together because people need people around them. And some people don't have so many people around them, you know, or don't have people around them who understand. So no, absolutely. But, but, kind of but you're right. But, 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 yeah, but the networks exist. And so if you're able just to, to facilitate that and make introductions and contacts and you know, share information, yeah, that, that's, that's a really worthwhile thing. You are right. Actually, probably, you know, if someone was to ask me what was the best, what were the best bits of being BPS president, those were, those conversations, I would say, yeah. definitely. I can yeah. imagine, for sure. Jamie, it's been brilliant talking to you. Um, it could go on and on <laughs> for a while, you know, so many That's things. It's, it's such a brilliant kind of rich, excellent topic to just get into, just get mucky with, you know, put it on the table, get in there, yeah. have all the lights around it, you know. Um, but thank you so much um, and, and yeah, yeah look forward to seeing you again